Hi everyone, I'm Liz Ortiguera from the GSB Alumni Committee in Singapore, and I'm really pleased to introduce our guest speaker today, Nir Ayal, who is now also based in Singapore uh, since March last year. Nir is an alumni of GSB 08, and he taught as a lecturer in marketing at the GSB and at the Plattner Institute of Design at Stanford. Nir writes about the intersection between like topics on this intersection between psychology, technology, and business. Um, he's the author of two best-selling books, which I highly recommend, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, and Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And um, Indistractable, he's here today to talk about some lessons from his latest book, Indistractable, which is really timely. I was telling him that people need this more than ever after what, you know, the lifestyle that we've had to adjust to given the pandemic and being on 24 seven with technology. Um, his book was recognized as one of the best business books of 2019. And, um, and I think you'll really enjoy some of the lessons. Nir will speak for about 45 min minutes and then we'll take questions afterwards. So hold your questions, we'll open up the chat and um, I'll be able to pick them up from there. So thank you, thank you for joining us today and over to you Nayal, Nir. Thank you so much, Liz. It's great to be here with everyone. I just want to start with where my story began, which is with my first book. And this is what I taught uh, at Stanford uh, at, the, uh, at the Platinum Institute of Design and before that at the GSB. Uh, some of you might remember Baba Shiv. Uh, if you took a class with him, uh, Baba and I took this class or uh, taught this class together. Uh, and this book was all about how companies can use the psychology behind what makes uh, some of the stickiest products in the world. When we think about the kind of products that get us hooked like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, Slack, Snapchat. What I wanted to understand and to democratize were these tactics that these companies use, not for their benefit, right? These companies have known how to do this for decades. I wanted to kind of steal their secrets so that the rest of us can build products and services to get people hooked for good. And that's exactly what's happened since my first book was published. Companies in the education space like Kahoot use the hook model to get kids hooked onto online education. Companies like Fitbod get people hooked to exercise. Uh, the New York Times uses the hook model to get people engaged with the news. So there are lots of ways that we can use habit forming technologies and habit forming products to help people build good habits in their lives. But if hooked was about how to help people build good habits, of course, I wanted to explore the other side. I wanted to explore what about these bad habits? What happens when products are designed to be so good, so engaging that sometimes they become distractions? And so the moment of reckoning for me in my life came when uh, shortly after I published Hooked, I found uh, that I had to reassess my own relationship with distraction when one afternoon I was with my daughter and we had this beautiful afternoon planned. And I remember we had this activity book of different things that daddies and daughters could do together. And one of the activities in the book was to ask each other this question. If you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I remember the question verbatim, but I can't tell you what my daughter said. Because in that moment, for whatever reason, I decided it was a good time to start checking my phone and by the time I looked up from my device, I realized that my daughter was gone, that she'd left the room to go play with some toy outside. And I had blown this perfect daddy-daughter moment. And if I'm really honest with you folks, it didn't just happen once and it didn't just happen with my daughter. It would happen when I got to work and I would say, oh, I'm definitely gonna work on that big project. And yet found 20, 30, 45 minutes later, I was doing everything but the thing I said I was gonna do that morning. It would happen when I would say to myself, oh, I'm definitely gonna exercise and eat right, and yet I wouldn't. And I wanted to understand why was this happening, right? The problem that we have today is not that we don't know what to do. We're all highly educated people here. We all basically know what to do. Who doesn't know that basically the way to you know, lose weight and uh, uh, live a healthy lifestyle is to eat right and exercise? We know that, and yet why don't we do it? We all know that if we want better relationships with the people we love in our lives, we have to be fully present with them. We know that. We all know that if we wanna excel at our jobs, we have to do the work, especially the hard stuff that other people don't wanna do. The question is not, 
that we don't know what to do. Heck, if you don't know how to do something, Google it. All the information is right there on your, at your fingertips. The question is not why don't we do what we know we should do. The question is why do we get distracted? Why do we keep getting in our own way? So if you ask me today what superpower I would most want, I would want the power to be indistractable. Becoming indistractable is the skill of the century because there is no area of your life that is not affected by your ability to sustain your attention. This is truly how we choose our life by deciding whether it's our mental health, our physical health, our relationships, our jobs require us to be able to pay attention and to be able to sustain that attention and uh, throughout whatever task we decide we want to accomplish. So, uh, the, the way we should start thinking about how do we become indistractable, how do we control our attention and choose our life, I think is to give us a little bit of historical perspective, which is to say that distraction is not a new problem. That in fact, even though people today think that, oh, it's Facebook, it's Twitter, it's my iPhone, it's these technologies that cause distraction, nothing could be further from the truth. That in fact, 2,500 years ago, the Greek philosopher Plato talked about akrasia, the tendency that we all have to do things against our better judgment. So this is not a new problem. This is an age old part of the human condition. The fact that we all do things against our better judgment, we all get distracted. And if Plato was complaining about how distracted people were 2,500 years ago, then that means that the cause, the root cause of this problem can't just be in our, in our cell phones. It has to go much deeper than that. And so to start our journey to become indistractable, we really need to understand what is this word distraction? What does that word even mean? I thought I understood it. It's one of these terms that everybody thinks they understand. But when you really press them on it, turns out I didn't have a very good understanding of what that word even meant. And the best way to make sure that we understand what something is, is to understand what it is not. So if I asked you, what's the opposite of distraction? What's the opposite of distraction? Most people will tell you that the opposite of distraction, of course, is focus, right? Isn't that the opposite of distraction, focus? Well, not exactly. You see, the opposite of distraction, if you look at the origin of the word, is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. That, in fact, both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And you'll notice that both words end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction, by definition, is any action that pulls you towards what you said you were going to do, things that you do with intent, things that move you towards your values and help you become the kind of person you want to become. The opposite of traction is distraction. Distraction is any action that pulls us further away from what we plan to do, things that we are not doing with intent, things that pull us away from our values and further away from becoming the people we want to become. So you say, okay, whatever, this is just semantics, what's the big deal? This is a really important point because I would argue that any action can be traction or distraction. Let me give you an example. Before I wrote this book, before I wrote Indistractable, my daily routine looked like this. I would get to work, I would look at my to-do list, and I would say to myself, ah, okay, I've got this big task I need to accomplish, this thing I've been procrastinating on, that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get started on that right away, let me do that because that's the most important thing, I gotta do it, here I go, I'm gonna get started. But first, let me check email first, right? Let me just scroll that Slack channel real quick to catch up on things, because that's a work-related task, right? I gotta do that anyway at some point today. So that's a, a, a worky related type of thing that, you know, it's okay if I just do that first. How many people does that happen to, right? That happens to us all the time. And we justify these distractions by thinking that they're work-related. And I call this pseudo-work, because this is the most dangerous form of distraction. The distraction that tricks us into prioritizing the urgent at the expense of the important. So anything can become a distraction if that is not what you plan to do. Just because it's a work-related task doesn't mean it's not a distraction. In fact, it's more so a distraction because you don't even realize you've gotten distracted. Now, just as anything can become a distraction, anything can be traction. So I am not one of these chicken little tech critics that we hear about all the time that tell us that technology is hijacking our brain, that it's addicting everyone, that there's nothing you can do about it. 
and that there's some kind of moral hierarchy that places some pastimes above others. Nonsense, garbage. Anything you want to do with your time, whether it's play a video game, scroll social media, watch a video on YouTube is fine. I'm not going to tell you not to do any of that stuff. Anything you want to do with your time is fine. As long as you do it according to your values and on your schedule, the time you plan to waste is not wasted time. Anything can be an act of traction as long as it is done with intent. Okay, so now we have traction and we have distraction. The next question is, well, what prompts us to traction and distraction? Here we have what we call two different types of triggers. The first kind of trigger is called an external trigger. An external trigger you'll be very familiar with. These are the pings, the dings, the rings, anything in our outside environment that can lead us towards traction or distraction. These are kind of the usual suspects where people tend to blame when they get distracted. They say, oh, my phone buzzed, my kids interrupted me, my colleague needed something. That tends to be the source of what most people blame on distraction. However, it turns out that that is not the leading cause of distraction. The leading cause of distraction, there was a study that was actually published just a few months ago that showed this, uh, how profound this is, it, this is that 90% of the time, 90% of the time that you check your cell phone, you are not checking it because of an external trigger. You are checking it because of an internal trigger. What is an internal trigger? An internal trigger is an uncomfortable emotional state that we seek to escape from. Loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, fearfulness, uh, anxiety, stress, these uncomfortable sensations that we seek to escape from. This is the leading cause of distraction. These uncomfortable sensations that we must escape from. And so as we begin our journey to become indistractable, we have to understand the discomfort we are trying to escape. Because let me tell you, it doesn't matter what the distraction is, whether it's too much news, too much booze, too much football, too much Facebook, whatever it might be. If we don't understand that distraction begins from within, we will always look for something to take our minds off of these uncomfortable emotional states. So the first big lesson I want you to write down and remember is that time management requires pain management. Let me say that again. Time management requires pain management because when it comes to these internal triggers, we really only have two choices here. There's only two things we can do with those uncomfortable sensations. We can either fix the source of the problem right? Figure out what's causing us that discomfort and do something about it, or we can learn tactics to cope with it. So let me give you just a few tactics. I wanted to give you some very practical uh, techniques that you can take uh, without reading the entire book, but just some, some quick hits I can give you immediately that you can use starting today to help you start mastering these, over, these internal triggers. Starting with noting the sensation. Psychologists tell us that by simply becoming aware of that sensation and writing it down, stress, anxiety, boredom, fearfulness, whatever it might be, if you can note the preceding emotion that comes before the distraction, that's a huge step forward. So I was feeling lonely, so I checked Facebook. I was uncertain, so I Googled. I was Bored, so I check the news, stock prices, sports scores, whatever it might be. If you can identify and write down that preceding emotion, that's the very first important step. The next thing we want to do is to get curious, not contemptuous. You see, many people, when they get distracted, they beat themselves up. We call these people the shamers. The shamers, they take it on the inside. They say, oh, there must be something wrong with me. Uh, maybe I have a short attention span. I have an addictive personality. I need some kind of diagnosis to tell me what's wrong with me. The shamers actually make the problem worse because shame is a very uncomfortable internal trigger. And we know what happens, the worse we feel, the more likely we are to seek escape with more distraction. So we don't wanna be shamers. The other group of people are what we call the blamers. The blamers say, oh, you see, it's social media, it's my cell phone, it's email, it's the world these days. 
right? How often do we hear people say things like this? These are the blamers. But of course, blaming things outside yourself doesn't fix the actual problem. We're not going to go back into some time machine to a magical time before distraction. Distraction has always been here and it always will be here. So blaming things outside yourself is futile. Shaming yourself is futile. So if we're not going to be blamers, we're not going to be shamers. We want to be claimers. What does a claimer do? A claimer claims how they respond, hence the term responsibility, to these uncomfortable sensations, to these urges. It's almost like a sneeze, okay? You can't control the urge to sneeze. Once you feel the urge to sneeze, you've already felt that urge. The question is, what do you do with that urge? Do you let yourself sneeze all over everyone in the room and get them sick? Hopefully not. The responsible thing to do is to take a, a handkerchief and cover your face, right? And it's the same way with our emotions. We do not control these urges. We do not control the internal triggers that prompt us to distraction. All we can control is how we will respond to that discomfort. Will we allow the discomfort to lead us towards escaping that feeling with unhealthy distraction? Or do we harness that discomfort and use it like rocket fuel to help us propel towards traction. So one of the techniques that we can use that psychologists recommends, and this comes from acceptance and commitment therapy, is surfing the urge. What psychologists tell us that emotions, these urges, these internal triggers are very much like waves, right? That in the moment when we feel these uncomfortable sensations, we think they're gonna last forever, but they never do. They act just like waves. They crest and then they subside. And if we can learn to surf the urge, this is one of many techniques that we can use to master these internal triggers. So what does this look like? What we wanna do is utilize what we call the 10 minute rule. The 10 minute rule says that we can give in to any distraction, whatever that distraction might be, but not right now, okay? We're not gonna tell ourselves no, we're not gonna use strict abstinence. Strict abstinence can backfire. Instead, what we, we wanna do is not tell ourselves no, we wanna tell ourselves not yet. And this is just as effective whether it's, hey, I, I, I really need to work on this big project, not check email, or I really wanna avoid eating that piece of chocolate cake because I'm trying to, uh, to stick to my diet, or I really wanna avoid smoking that cigarette. We're not gonna tell ourselves no, we're gonna tell ourselves not yet. And what we're gonna do is set a timer for just 10 minutes. And if we still desire, if we still have that craving, hey, we can give into that sensation in 10 minutes. But for those 10 minutes, here's what I want you to do. I want you to either get back to the task at hand, get back to whatever it is you said you were going to do, that act of traction, or get curious about that sensation. Just sit for a moment and experience what it is that's going on inside your body right now, okay? With curiosity, not with contempt. Don't be a blamer, don't be a shamer, but instead just reflect upon that sensation. Okay, what am I experiencing right now? This is a method to help us surf that urge. And what you will find is by the time those 10 minutes are up, nine times out of 10, you won't feel that urge anymore. It will have crested and subsided just like a wave. And your job is to surf that urge like a surfer on a surfboard. So those are just a, a few techniques. There's a lot more in the book that we don't have time for today, but just wanted to give you a few very practical tips. The next step to becoming indistractable is to make time for traction, right? We talked about the difference between traction and distraction. Another thing I want everyone to remember is that we cannot call something a distraction unless we know what it distracted us from. Let me say that again. You cannot call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So, you know, over the years, I've worked with hundreds of people and many times I'll hear, hear people telling me, you know, I can't seem to get anything done. I've got a, a to-do list a mile long. And for some reason, I keep getting distracted that, uh, you know, my kids want this and my boss wants this. And oh my goodness, did you see what happened in the news today? I, I just keep getting distracted. And then I'll ask them, well, what did you get distracted from exactly? What did you plan to do with your time? And nine times out of, the, out of 10, the answer is, I'm not really sure. Right? But look at my to-do list. I didn't finish all these things I plan to do. But that's not the question. The question is, what did you get distracted from? How did you plan your day? And for the vast majority of people, they don't keep a schedule. And even if you do keep a schedule, most people don't keep a schedule properly. Because in this day and age, if you don't schedule your time down to the minute, someone's going to schedule it for you. 
okay? This is called time boxing. And this is a technique that has been studied for decades. This is one of the most effective things you can do to become indistractable is to use this technique of time boxing to plan out how you want to spend your time. And in fact, this is the only way to know the difference between traction and distraction. Everything you plan to do with intent is traction. Everything else is distraction. Now, I'm not telling you to be an automaton and only do work all day. No, I want you to plan time to be with your kids, to play video games, to watch movies on Netflix, whatever it is you want to do that you find fun. Great. Do it but do it on your schedule, not somebody else's, certainly not the tech company's schedule. What we wanna do is to plan the time, not the output. You see, most people, myself included, we utilize this terrible technique of running our life with a to-do list. And I'm gonna kill this sacred cow right now because running your life with a to-do list is one of the worst things you can do for your productivity. Now, I'm not saying it's not a good idea to write down the things you need to get done. That's fine, right? Get them out of your brain and get them on paper, get them somewhere outside of your head. What I'm against is waking up in the morning, first thing you look at when you say, what am I supposed to be doing? Is if you look at your to-do list before you look at your calendar, you've already lost. Why? Because a to-do list gives us no constraints. And what we do is add more and more and more to our to-do list. And we end up in this terrible cycle of not getting those things done. And so what happens at the end of the day when we look at this, all this unfinished work that we didn't get done and we say to ourselves, wait, I said I was going to do this stuff and I didn't. What does that say about me? What does that say about my personal integrity, right? If I keep lying to myself, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, I begin to internalize this new self-image of someone who doesn't follow through. And now I start believing, wait a minute, maybe I'm not good with time management. Maybe I'm not the kind of person who can focus. And now we've lost the war. So as opposed to planning the output, as opposed to measuring yourself based on how many boxes you checked off, try measuring yourself instead by the input not the output. What is the input for knowledge workers? What, what do we, what's the input to do the kind of work we have to do? It's only two things, our time and attention. Our time and attention. So what I want you to do is to start measuring yourself based on a new metric, not how many boxes you checked off, but by this new metric of did I do what I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would. That's it. Did I do what I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would. So if I said I'm going to you know, work on that proposal for 30 minutes, or I'm gonna make an hour of sales calls, or I'm gonna check email for an hour and a half, whatever it is, did I do that and only that for as long as I said I would? And here's the kicker. The people who use this method, the people who use this time boxing technique have been shown to actually finish more. They get more done than the people who use the time boxing technique. So plan the time, the input, not the output. The next thing we need to do is to spend less time communicating and more time concentrating. You see, there are two types of work. We have what we call reactive work and reflective work. Reactive work is how most people spend their time, right? They react to emails, react to, to Slack notifications, react to meetings, react to phone calls all day long reacting and they put no time in their day for reflective work. Reflective work is the kind of work that is required for planning, for thinking ahead, for, for, for deciding what really matters, for prioritizing. All that kind of work requires reflective work and it must be done without distraction. So if you want a huge leg up, if you want a competitive advantage over everyone in your industry, do something that nobody else is doing, make time to think. Now, I don't care if it's 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour in your day, have that time carved out and keep it sacred, protect it. Make sure you have time in your calendar to do that reflective work. All of us require at least some time to do that reflective work without distraction. Now, part of the reason that all this communicating, all this uh, email and Slack notifications is so corrosive uh, to our productivity and can be such a source of distraction is because it comes coupled with these external triggers, these pings, dings, and rings that can so frequently lead us off track. Well, 
there's actually a, a, a way that we can hack back these external triggers. And, and to get you thinking about how we can hack back, how we can fight against these external triggers, I wanna ask you if you can think for yourself here for a minute, if I were to ask you what is the third leading cause of death in the United States? Now this statistic is before Corona, so don't think about 2020, think about 2019 and before. If I were to ask you what was the third leading cause of death in the United States of America, I'll give you the first two, okay? Number one was heart disease, number two was cancer, Number three, believe it or not, if it was a disease, would have been prescription mistakes. Prescription mistakes. People inside medical facilities, inside hospitals, receiving the wrong medication or the wrong dosage of medication from healthcare providers. Can you believe it? It's a huge, huge problem. That is until a group of nurses at UCSF decided to tackle this problem. And they wanted to figure out what was going on here. Why were so many people getting the wrong dosage of medication or the wrong medication completely with such disastrous consequences? And they found that lo and behold, the reason, the cause of this problem was distraction. That what was happening that on average, when nurses were dosing out medication, they were interrupted 10 times on average by their colleagues. And every time they were distracted, they made mistakes. And these mistakes had dire consequences for their patients. Now, why am I telling you this story? I'm guessing very few of you are, are nurses in healthcare. I'm telling you this story because of course, we have the same effect on our work. When we are constantly distracted, when we are taken off track by these external triggers, whether it's from colleagues, kids, emails, Slack notifications, whatever the case might be, we also make mistakes. And we don't even realize we're making these mistakes, just like these nurses who were dosing out the wrong medication. They didn't realize they were making these mistakes until it was too late. Well, the good news is that these nurses, when they conducted this study, found an ingenious solution that reduced prescription mistakes by 88%. Did you hear that? They reduced this problem by almost 88%. And the solution was not some fancy new technology. It wasn't some expensive retraining program. The solution, believe it or not, was cheap plastic vests. Plastic vests that these nurses wore that told their colleagues, drug round in progress, do not disturb. How simple was that? Another thing they did, they marked specific areas that when a nurse was working in this area, this was a no interruption zone, okay? Almost eliminated this problem completely. So why am I telling you this story? Well, I'm telling you this story because we can apply this in our own lives. If we're knowledge workers, whether we're working in an office, working at home, we can do something very similar. We can also hack back external triggers. So every copy of my book, Indistractable, comes with this screen sign that you can tear out of the book. It's made of cardstock. You fold it into thirds and you put it on your computer monitor. For those of you who are back in the office, you can use this to tell your colleagues, hey, you know what? For this hour, for this 30 minutes, whatever the case might be, this is my reflective work time. I can't be interrupted unless it's really important. So what you're doing is interrupting the interruption. But you say, yeah, but I'm working from home right now, right? Don't you know there's a pandemic going on? Of course I do. Well, here's the thing. Uh, we can utilize the same technique when it comes to distractions that may come from our kids, from our spouse, from our uh, roommates. They can also be a source of distraction. How do we do that? Well, this is a picture of my wife wearing what we call in our household, the concentration crown. And the concentration crown is a way for us to signal to our daughter. We, we implemented this when she was just six years old. And we told her, look, when mommy is wearing the concentration crown, that means that she cannot be interrupted. Okay. And it works like a charm. I also have a concentration crown. It doesn't look like this, but anybody can do this with just whatever silly hat you can find around the house. If you have young kids at home, you let them know, Hey, when, when I'm wearing this hat, that means I can't be interrupted because frankly, they don't know if you're on your laptop, they don't know if that's the kind of work that uh, requires focus or not. The concentration crown or, or an idea like it interrupts the interruption. Another thing we can do as we're working from home is to have digital uh, versions of this with our colleagues. So for example, you can use this free, free service called isbusy.app. You can see the URL at the bottom, which tells your colleague the equivalent of that screen sign virtually. 
So before a colleague interrupts you with a phone call, they can check real quick to see, hey, are you available for interruption? Is this time when you're uh, doing reactive work or reflective work based on this quick uh, URL? They can see what you're up to. Another thing we can do is to use technology to help us hack back the interruptions that come from technology. So all of us today have phones that come built in with this amazing function called do not disturb while driving. So when you plan that time in your day, when you're going to work without interruption, you know, many people have this fear. Yeah, but what if there's an emergency? What if somebody needs me, right? No problem. You turn on do not disturb while driving, which comes on everybody's Android and iPhone. And if someone calls or texts you during that time when this feature is engaged, they will get an automatic response that says, I'm sorry, I can't talk right now. But if this is urgent, text me with the word urgent. And if they text back the word urgent, then the message will come through. I've been using this feature for years now. Let me tell you, there, I haven't been interrupted even once because they know that, okay, I'll, I'll get to it in 30 minutes or an hour when, when, when I have time. And look, if it's really so super urgent, they can always text you the word and the call will come through and the text message will come through. Another thing we can do is to hack back the external triggers that clud, clutter our digital space. So how many of us have desktops that look like this? Studies find that digital clutter is a huge drag on our productivity. Well, we don't have to live this way. We can take all those files, all those external triggers that don't serve us, put them in a big folder, call that folder everything, and have a nice pristine desktop so that we can actually focus on our work without these constant external triggers. The same goes for our phones. You know, how many of us have constant notifications, pings and dings? Well, look, there's nothing that Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey can do if we change those notification settings. Two thirds of people with a smartphone, two thirds of people with a smartphone never change their notification settings. Can we honestly say that the technology is addicting us, that it's hijacking our brains when we haven't taken even a few minutes to change those notification settings to make sure that they are serving us as opposed to us serving them? You know, these technologies are wonderful as long as they are serving us. So by asking ourselves this fundamental question with all the various external triggers in our life of is this trigger me or am I serving it? This is how we can make sure that we can hack back these, uh, these external triggers by adjusting the notification settings. And then finally, making sure that when we are together, right? If we are going to meet, whether it's in a business context, a family context, if we are going to be together in the physical world, we need to be present both in body and mind, which means that when we're going to get together, let's leave those distracting devices outside of those meetings until they're over. Now, the last thing we can do is to prevent distraction with paths, this fourth and final step. Now, this is the firewall against distraction. This is the last step that we take after we've done the other three steps first. Preventing distraction with packs utilizes a 2,500 year old technique that is first described in the story of the Odyssey. Now in the story of the Odyssey written by Homer 2,500 years ago, Homer tells us about Ulysses, this hero that has to sail his ship past the island of the Sirens. Now the Sirens are these mythical creatures that sing this magical song that anyone that hears the siren song is compelled to crash their ship on the shore of the Sirens, Sirens Island and dies. Now, Ulysses knows this is going to happen. He knows about this threat. He knows that he might get distracted by the siren song, and he's smart enough to take action today to prevent getting distracted tomorrow. What does he do? He tells his crew to put beeswax in their ears so they can't hear the siren song. And then he instructs them to bind him to the mast of the ship. And he tells them, no matter what I do, no matter what I say, do not let me go. And you know what? His plan works. Ulysses is able to sail his ship past the shore of the Sirens Island and return his crew and his ship safely home. Now, why do I tell you this story? Because of course, there's lots of distracting stuff out there you are Ulysses, and of course, that could be you there on the Sirens Island dead. So we want to make sure that we take steps to prevent us from getting distracted as the last line of defense by entering what today we call a Ulysses Pact. How do we make a Ulysses Pact? 
Well, it turns out we can make pacts by using the very technology that can oftentimes be the source of distraction. These are two tools that I use almost every single day. On the right, you see Self-Control, which is an app uh, for, for your desktop that when you engage will prevent you from accessing any app or website that you determine in advance. On my phone, I use this great app called Forest. Forest is wonderful. Every time I need to do writing time, I need to do my reflective work time, uh, I, and, I, and I think I might be tempted towards distraction, I open up this neat little app, I dial in how much time I want to do my reflective work for, I hit this button that says plant, and as soon as I hit plant, this cute little virtual tree is planted on my screen. Now, if I pick up my phone and I do anything with it, that cute little virtual tree dies. It gets chopped down. So that's enough of an incentive. I don't want to be a virtual tree murderer. So it's enough of an incentive to remind me, oh, wait a minute. That's not what I wanted to do right now. I wanted to stay focused on this other task right now. I want to do my reflective work. Don't pick up my phone right now. It's a bit of a promise I made to myself, a pact that I entered to keep me on track as a last line of defense. Another thing that you can do is to get a focused friend, right? So if you have a colleague at work that you can sit down with, maybe you can go to a coffee shop together or you know, f uh, find time uh, specifically to keep each other accountable. And of course, I know many of us are working from home. We can't work together. No problem. Technology to the rescue. There's a great website called focusmate.com that I use so often. I love so much actually invested in the company. Here's how it works. When you want to do your reflective work, you book that time in advance. Let's say you say, if you're anything like me, you have trouble getting started in the morning, but you really want to do that reflective work time. You book that time on your calendar. You can see it here on the left-hand side. Let's say 8 a.m. is the time you want to get up and really start doing that, that reflective work time, but you need a little, you need a, a, a firewall. You need some, some accountability. Well, you find a, a focus friend on this, a focus mate on this calendar. And at that time, you'll get a video feed of your focus mate. You can see here on the right-hand side, this was a medical school student in the Czech Republic who was memorizing human anatomy while I was preparing this presentation. And we checked in, took us you know, five seconds to say, hello, what are you working on? What are you working on? Go. Having that accountability, having that person that you are making a pact with can be an incredibly effective way to make sure you stay on track. So we can reduce distractions with these packs. We can use tech to block out distractions. But let me give you a word of warning. You must be careful, okay? Two really important things to remember here. Number one, this comes last. Don't jump into making a pack. There's other packs we didn't discuss as well, but are very important. Price packs, effort packs, and identity packs that you can use, but don't jump into it before first doing the other three steps. You have to first master internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back the external triggers. Then as the last line of defense, you're going to make one of these packs. That's one word of warning. The other word of warning is that we know that for some people, this technique can backfire. Okay. Some people, this technique backfires. Why? Those people turns out are people who have a really tough time getting back on track, right? All of us will fall off track from time to time. We will get distracted from time to time. It's, it happens, it's normal. The difference between someone who is distractible and someone who is indistractable is that an indistractable person realizes why they got distracted and they do something about it. Uh, I love this quote by Poela Coelho who said that a mistake repeated more than once is a decision. So if we keep getting distracted by the same things again and again and again, eventually we're deciding to be distractible. So the difference between someone who is distractible and someone who is indistractable is that the indistractable person wakes up and realizes that there are only three causes of every distraction. Either it's an external trigger, an internal trigger, or a planning problem, and they do something about it. Now, a distractible person gives up and says, oh, it's just, it just doesn't work. I can't make it work for me. And it turns out that one of the defining traits of those people who continue to be distractible are people who don't give themselves self-compassion. Turns out that people who are able to give themselves self-compassion are much more likely to achieve all kinds of goals in life. Well, how do we cultivate self-compassion? It turns out we cultivate self-compassion very simply by talking to ourselves the way we would talk to a good friend, right? So if I were to tell you about what happened with my daughter, 
that I'm embarrassed, that I'm ashamed, that I got distracted when I really meant to be with someone I love very much. Would you tell me I'm a horrible human being? Would you tell me I'm a terrible father? Not if you were my good friend, you wouldn't say that. But you know what? I used to say that to myself all the time. And it wasn't helpful and it wasn't true. And here's what else isn't true. This notion that there's nothing we can do to help ourselves overcome these technology distractions, that somehow technology is hijacking our brains, that we're powerless to resist, that we're addicted, rubbish. There is so much we can do. We can master the internal triggers. We can make time for traction. We can hack back the external triggers and we can prevent distraction with packs. So today I just covered in the past few minutes, uh, the model, the framework around the first half of the book, what we didn't have time for is the other context of our lives where we interact with other people. So even if we become indistractable ourselves, what about all the environments we operate in, right? So the, uh, the second half of the book, which unfortunately we didn't have time to go into too much depth, but I hope you'll, 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 you'll look into it further, uh, is about how do we become indistractable at work? How do we build an indistractable organization? How do we raise indistractable kids? And finally, how do we have indistractable relationships? But the message I wanna leave with you today is that we can do this. I truly believe that we can get the best out of these technologies without letting them get the best of us. We can all become indistractable. Thank you so much. And with that, I think we have uh, about 15 minutes for questions. Would love to take them. So if you want to start writing them in the chat function, that'd be great. And as I take those questions, I have a quick favor to request from you. If you could be so kind as to take this quick survey, if you go to this URL, opinion2.us, notice it's not.com, it's opinion2.us. If you type in that URL, or if you happen to have your phone handy, you can just point your camera at that QR code and you'll be taken to a, 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 a Google survey where I would love to hear what you thought of the presentation. I read every single comment. So if you have any uh, uh, feedback, that'd be terrific. Uh, take you all of 30 seconds to, to, uh, to, to do this little survey I have for you. And when you complete that survey, when you click submit, you will get a link to my slide share page where you can have all the slides you just saw. And I hope you'll you know, share those with, uh, with your colleagues, with your friends, with your family, whoever might find it useful. If you find it useful, that'd be great. And if we don't get to your question today, please do visit me at nearandfar.com. There's a contact form there. If we don't get to your question today, please feel free to reach out to me. Happy to hear from you there. And with that, Liz, I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Nir. And I'm sure everyone in the audience will agree that you gave some really valuable um, advice. All of us need some um, measures of hacking back, you know, and making technology work for us in, you know, so that we can focus on our own values and goals and not be distracted 24 seven. So thank you so much. Um, I'll start with a question. I know that, um, you, you know, it's clear how beneficial these techniques can be um, for self management and personal interests. And I know in your book, you go into the fact that a couple of organizations that you mentioned um, that have the, the image or the reputation of being 24 by seven, having a very full on work um, culture like BCG and Slack. Um, mm -hmm. but, but you know, they've found the benefit in having employees that follow these, these principles. Um, can you briefly comment on that? Sure, yeah. So there's a whole section in the book on how to build an indistractable workplace. Uh, which is which is essentially acknowledges that look you know what what if I'm indistractable okay I'm going to do everything near tells me to do I'm going to master internal triggers make time for traction hack back external triggers and prevent distraction with packs, but my boss keeps bothering me all day. My, my boss keeps interrupting me every time I try and do reflective work. My boss doesn't respect the fact that I need time to focus. Well, this acknowledges that distraction is not just about our devices. It's about company culture, that uh, organizations that have this problem of distraction also have other problems, right? Because the real issue about a, a surrounding distraction in the workplace, the real cause of the problem is that we can't talk about the problem of distraction in the workplace. That turns out to be the real culprit. So there are a few different facets of a workplace that is indistractable, right? That, that I, I profile in the book, two companies, Boston Consulting Group and Slack. And we find there are some common tenets at, at these companies. You know, one of the things that uh, we find is that employees have a forum 
to talk about this problem. Okay, that's the first aspect, the first trait of companies that are indistractable. People can talk about this problem with what we call psychological safety, without the fear that raising this concern would get them fired. Because there's this perception that if I want to talk about the problem of distraction, that somehow I'm not a team player, that I'm not pulling my weight. And so people don't talk about the problem at all. And it turns out that if you can't talk about this problem, guess what? You probably got all kinds of other skeletons in the closet that prevent you from talking about other problems in your organization. So for example, at the Boston Consulting Group, and this is a company that I know intimately because I used to work, it was my first job out of, uh, out of college. I, I, I worked at the Boston Consulting Group. And back then, circa 2001, it was a very hard charging 24 seven culture. And they've really reformed that since. They've, they've changed many uh, aspects of this because they found that they had a very high employee turnover. I was one of these employees that just, just couldn't do it because it was unsustainable to constantly always be on. There was no time where I could feel like I wasn't connected to the office. And so they actually worked with a Harvard psychologist uh, 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 who helped them establish the psychological safety that they needed and the forum to talk about this problem of distraction. They, they implemented what they call PTO, predictable time off. And here's how it worked. Basically what they did, they said, what would it take to give everyone on a case team, they took one case team of eight people and they said, what would it take? Here's the challenge. What would it take to give everyone one predictable night off where they could you know, go to dinner with their family, go to the gym, uh, watch TV, do anything but work, just one night off per week. And when this researcher asked this one case team at Boston Consulting Group, could we do that? Oh, she heard every excuse in the book. Oh, no, 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 we're a distributed workforce. We're in the client services business. We have to be always on impossible, can't happen. So here's what she said. She said, okay, how about this? Let's, let's, let's uh, a role play here that this isn't for us. This is for one of your clients, right? You're BCG, you work with the biggest companies in the world. What would happen if one of your clients said, hey, uh, we wanna give every employee one predictable night off per week. Could we make that happen? I said, okay, let's try that. And you know what? They quickly figured out ways to give everyone one predictable night off. It actually wasn't that hard. What they needed was the place to talk about this problem without the fear of, of retribution, without the fear that they'd be judged, with the psychological safety they needed to talk about the problem. So number one is giving employees psychological safety to talk about the problem in the first place. Number two is giving them a forum to talk about the problem. And at, at uh, BCG, it was these, this, this predictable time off discussion that, that they, they now actually expanded throughout the workplace. Uh, I, I profile in the book Slack that does it a little differently. They don't have these meetings where they talk about predictable time off. They, at Slack, they actually have Slack channels devoted to what they call beef tweets, where people have these specific Slack channels where they can voice concerns, right? They can voice their beef with the company. And they do something very interesting. They actually use emoji to show that they are, these concerns have been aired and seen and acted upon. So they'll use, management will use the eye emoji to show an employee that, yep, we saw that, or a check mark to say, yep, we're gonna fix that problem. Again, it doesn't mean that management needs to always fix every employee concern. It does mean, however, that employees need to feel heard and have a place to talk about those concerns. So number one is, is, is psychological safety. Number two is a forum to talk about these problems. Number three, and perhaps most importantly, is that management needs to display what it means to be indistractable. That as we all learned at the GSB, culture flows downhill. So people will look to their manager, to their boss, and see how online they are, how connected they are, what the expectations are. And if they don't walk the walk, well, you know, they can't talk the talk either. And so one of the things that I saw at Slack that I was amazed, you know, this is this hard charging Silicon Valley startup. And when I visited them several years ago, they, in the company headquarters, and they still have this at, at uh, HQ in San Francisco, where, when you walk to the employee canteen, right, where people are mingling, you will see in big pink bright letters, neon letters, it's written, work hard and go home. <laughs> okay, not what you would expect to see at a Silicon Valley uh, startup that's now you know, been acquired by Salesforce, but this is what they've had since day one, this, this slogan, work hard and go home, and they mean it. At 6 p.m., the office is empty. And if you check Slack uh, after hours on nights and weekends, you are reprimanded. 
That is not what they do. That is not part of the company culture because everybody from Stuart Butterfield on down appreciated this, this, this notion that to get our best work from folks, they need downtime. They need time when they can do reflective work or be with their families or do whatever else they intended to do with their time. And they display that to their workforce by how leadership behaves. So that's the third aspect that management needs to exemplify what it means to be indistractable themselves. Thank you. And those are two great examples of how this doesn't just work for the individual, it works for the organization too and the business. Um, I'm seeing some great questions come across. Um, Eduardo is asking, what do you think about the Pomodoro technique? Sure. So the Pomodoro technique is one of many techniques. Um, it's, uh, it's essentially time blocking uh, by the hour. So saying, okay, for the next, uh, whatever, 25 minutes, I, I'm just going to work on one task. I think it's, it's, it's a tool. It's not the end all because, and, and most importantly, if you skip the first step of mastering the internal triggers, uh, the Pomodoro technique won't work. Because if you do nothing but set a timer for yourself, for those of you who aren't aware of the Pomodoro technique, basically you're just setting a timer, saying I'm gonna work for this amount of time and you, don't, you try not to do anything else, which is great. But if you haven't first dealt with those internal triggers, right? If you have this burning itch of, oh, this task is horrible, I really don't feel like doing it, let me just go do something else for a quick minute, you're gonna fail, you're gonna cheat, right? Uh, if you don't hack back the external triggers, if you're constantly interrupted by pings and dings, you're going you're gonna to fall off track. If you don't implement these pacts, you're going to fall off track. So what I learned uh, in the five years of research that I did for uh, Indistractable is that it's really about this concert of using these four techniques together, mastering the internal triggers, making time for traction, hacking back external triggers, and preventing distraction with pacts. This, the, we, we got to do all four. That's great. Thank you. Stephanie asked the question, how would you address avoidance and avoidance behavior and how to overcome uh, this? How do, I, guess, I think she means how, do, how to achieve this increased productivity. I, if, I, if I think I understand correctly, so avoidance meaning this uncomfortable sensation uh, that, mm. that, that broods up inside of us and then makes us avoid the task. I think that's what she's asking. I'm not exactly sure, yes. but uh, so. that, that's a great example of an internal trigger, right? And the, the number one reason we don't do what we say we're going to do, if we're really honest with ourselves, is that we don't feel like it, right? We know we should exercise. But I don't want to. I don't feel like it. I know I'm supposed to work on that big project right now, but eh, it can wait till a little bit later. It's feelings. At the end of the day, fundamentally, procrastination, distraction, it's not a character flaw. There's nothing wrong with you. It's simply that we don't have the tools in our toolkit to deal with discomfort in a healthy manner. So this is where we have to reimagine the task, reimagine the trigger, and reimagine our temperament so that we have these tools ready so that when we don't feel like it, okay, we know what to do. We have ways to master these internal triggers. Great. Um, and there's a great section in your book that um, it, it was so insightful to me as a parent because you gave an example of how this technique can actually be taught to children and not to underestimate their ability to you know to do the same to you know identify their priorities and manage their own schedule and i thought that was brilliant um so a question came across what would you say to teens who insist that they can only do homework with music and social media at least going at the same time yeah so there's a whole section in the book around uh how to raise indistractable kids and as, as the father of a tween uh you know we, we've uh th this is very pertinent for us and it was really important you know i think if becoming indistractable is important for our generation it's even more important for the next generation you know that we know where this trend is going the world is not becoming less distracted quite the opposite the world is becoming a more distracted place and so I really do think that there will be a bifurcation between people who are indistractable and people who are distractible, people who let their time and attention be controlled and manipulated by others, and people who say to themselves, nope, I decide how I spend my time. I decide how I control my attention because that is ultimately how I choose my life. Uh, and so it's imperative that we teach our children how to be indistractable. And so the way we do it is with the same four steps, right? We understand their internal triggers. There's a larger discussion there around why kids are looking for escape. It's actually, to me, the most, uh, maybe the most important part of the entire book is really understanding why are kids looking for escape? Let me tell you, social media, video game use, uh, 
among kids is not the disease. It is the symptom of the disease. And there's a whole discussion we can go into there around what is really uh, inside going on in kids' heads. What's the deeper psychology? And this is where I refer to self-determination theory and, and, and the, the deeper reasons why kids are looking for escape through these devices. Very, very important for us as parents to really understand the root causes of distraction because parents have always been blaming one thing or another for ruining kids' brains, right? My generation, it was rap music. And before that, uh, it was the radio and the television, comic books. Everything is melting kids' minds. And of course, there's always a deeper reason that of course, we, you know, we as parents don't really wanna think about and talk about, but is imperative for us to understand. The next step is to make time for traction. That if kids, uh, you know, especially now that so many of us are homeschooling, including in my family, we have to have that schedule. And, you know, kids starting from, you know, school age children need to get into this practice of understanding what's in their day. Part of the reason that kids have trouble focusing is that they want to do the things they enjoy. They want to play video games. They want to socialize with their friends. Uh, they want to go outside if they're able to. But without having that schedule, without understanding when that time is coming in their day, they ruminate on it. When can I do it? When can I do it? When can I do it? Well, you know, we know, yes, it's right there in the calendar. That's when you're going to have time to play your video games or do whatever else. And I promise mommy, daddy, we will not interrupt you during that time. Very, very important to make time for traction, whatever it is they say they're going to do. Hacking back the external triggers. This gets to the, the question around, you know, potential external triggers. Look, you know, if, if someone wants music in the background and they're able to do what they say they're going to do, well, then it's not a distraction. That may not be a problem for them. What I do advise against is having anything that beeps, boops, or buzzes in the bedroom. Okay, there's no good reason I, that I can come up with why a child needs a television set. You know, we talk about the new latest technologies. What about older technologies like television, like radio? Anything that potentially interrupts sleep doesn't have a place in the bedroom, including, of course, cell phones and laptops. So that's about hacking back those external triggers. A good test of whether a child is ready for a technology is do they know how to turn it off? Right? That's a wonderful test. When they come to the dinner table, are they able to turn off their technologies? When they're doing their homework, are they able to turn on do not disturb? Do they understand how to put it away? And if they're, they're not ready, or if they don't know how to use those, uh, the, 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 those functions in the, uh, with the device, then they're not ready for the technology. It's kind of like a swimming pool, right? You wouldn't throw a kid into a swimming pool before they know how to swim. Well, we wouldn't give a kid a technology unless they know how to turn off the negative aspects of that technology. And then finally, making pacts with these pre-commitment devices. My daughter loves Forest. It's a very simple app. We talked about it earlier, the one with the tree. You know, anybody of, of pretty much any age can use that type of app to make these pacts. Uh, and so it's really about the same four techniques. But I will say the most important thing you can do if you want to raise indistractable kids, the most important thing you can do is to set a good example yourself. Mm -hmm. We cannot tell our kids, you know, get off Facebook while we're checking email. <laughs> right, we can't tell them stop playing Fortnite while we're uh, engrossed in, in checking our devices. We have to set that example ourselves and become indistractable, so for their sake as well as ours. That's great, thank you, Nir. And um, I guarantee to the audience, we've heard so many um, valuable lessons in the past hour, and I I guarantee that if you read his book, you'll get even more. Um, you know, so to live better, work better follow these guidelines and read his book. So thank you so much. We're at the top of the hour. So that brings us to the close of the session. And uh, thank you all for dialing in from various parts of the world. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Stay indistractable.